What's important to you? What do you value? What makes you happy? No matter how you answered, I'd like to know. Would your answers change if you were telling your significant other, a work acquaintance, your boss? The answer to that is probably yes, right? I mean, we don't tell everybody everything that we love. We don't want our boss judging us for the smutty reality television we watch on the weekends. But likewise, we don't also tell our family or friends everything that we like. We don't tell them all of our interests, right? We don't want to feel judged. We don't want to feel looked down upon. We see some of these things as maybe intellectually inferior, and we like to think of ourselves well. We want other people to think of us well. So we don't always share these things. I'm talking, of course, about guilty pleasures, the idea of a guilty pleasure. Reality television, pop music, fashion trends, cultural touchstones that are wildly popular right now, but whenever you bring up the fact that you enjoy them, that you spend your time engaging with them, you can feel a little judged. Well, my guest today on Head on Fire hopes to change that. Every episode of Head on Fire, we try to ask and seek answers to one of life's biggest or smallest questions. And on this one, we're asking, what's so guilty about our pleasures? My guest today is Dr. Eva Burke. She literally studies pop culture and teaches it at Trinity College Dublin. And she has a lot to say about the subject of guilty pleasures. I really have an issue with the concept of a guilty pleasure. I hate when people ask me what I what my guilty pleasures are because I refuse to feel guilty about anything that I enjoy. I mean, unless it's illegal and t they tend not to be. I know. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm fully in agreement. And that's, yeah. that's why I love talking to you and interacting with you on social mm -hmm. media because like – just the entire concept of a guilty pleasure mm -hmm. feels so weird. And I don't even know, I don't even know that I've ever truly identified with the phrase guilty pleasure. I mean, I've certainly used it. Um, but like it just internal that using that language over and over and over again, eventually internalizes that what you're doing mm -hmm. is something that you shouldn't be doing. Yes, like you should feel bad. You definitely shouldn't tell people about this. I really hate that that idea. Um, I love sharing when I'm watching trashies, as you know, trashy stuff on Twitter. Um, we bond over like the trashiest of Netflix. Um, I <laughs> listen. I love. I love trash. I, I what what is that uh, Marie Kondo? Quote? I love mess. I love mess. I love mess. <laughs> I yeah. love mess. Mm -hmm. But like, I, why should you feel bad about that? I don't, I really don't like that people try to, especially because my Twitter is kind of semi-professional. Like it is, it's not linked to my institutional work, but I, I do identify myself as um, an academic. Sometimes people are like quite judgmental about that. And they're like, well, why would you talk about selling sunset or, you know, the, the shit that I watch, um, on your Twitter account, but to me, that's just I I would not I would not feel even slightly ashamed um, about talking about that stuff. It's such a part of my life, and like, like I love it. So, yeah. So, what is your field of like your specific field of of study or your specific field of academia? So, um, my master's degree was actually on popular literature. So on kind of genre fiction, um, mm -hmm. all different kinds of genres. And then my PhD was specifically on uh, crime fiction. So female-centered crime fiction, um, which mm -hmm. I still love and consume constantly. Um, so I do spend a lot of time, I suppose, working with popular culture anyway, even professionally. Um, so I, yeah, I, that barrier for me has never existed. There's never been a barrier between like stuff I'll talk about professionally and stuff that I will be embarrassed to talk about. I would love to talk about Selling Sunset in a college or in a class. I would love to teach Selling Sunset studies if that were a thing. I would love to talk about genre fiction as a legitimate mm -hmm field of study because i feel like mm -hmm. the only time i ever hear people talking about genre fiction is people defending genre fiction mm -hmm. as a legitimate form of writing like um people will say oh there uh this uh something that made sort of a twitter discourse this past week 
um, oh, this science fiction novel is great. Uh, it mm-hmm. transcends science fiction. And what they really mean is it's good for science fiction. Yeah, like, you I, know, like it's, oh gosh, it's so well written as though science fiction can't be. Well yeah, written. I see a lot of that the word transcends in crime fiction criticism as well. So what they're saying is it's not really a crime novel. It's really good. So we're going to say it's better than your average crime novel. And I really, I really don't like that um, because it's, it's so devalues the, um, the actual work that goes into creating something like that. And it so devalues the, um, the message and the content. Like there can be so much, um, value, cultural value, and artistic value in um, in a work of, of sci-fi or crime fiction. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't, I think things are changing a little bit. Like since I did my master's, um, people tend to react with less skepticism when I tell them that I, I study popular culture and popular fiction. Um, so I think things are, are, are changing somewhat, but I did see on Twitter um, a few weeks ago, um, somebody tweeted about like reading statistics, I think in America and who's reading and how many people are reading. And um, the number was quite, the figure was quite high. And somebody, I think it was a man responded, yes, but they're probably skewed by women reading romance novels. Um, and, and I was like, well, yeah, but there's still people and they're still reading. So what what's not clicking? Like, obviously they're still consuming books and reading literature. It's just not something you approve of or you would read, you know, I, I don't like that. So that actually gets me towards sort of the crux of why I wanted to talk to you Mm. specifically is that there are certain kinds of arts, certain Mm. kinds of media, certain kinds of literature that we hold up as having value, as Mm. adding to society, as being real literature. And the thing is, Mm. I mean, you know, even even being a writer myself and and a reader and a lover of the arts and an artist and all of that, you know, I still have to kind of deprogram myself mm. a lot of times from like, oh sure, I'm a writer, but I'm not like them. You know, I'm an artist, but I'm not like them. And 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 that comparison of uh, you know, this work is just intrinsically more valuable. Mm-hmm. than this other work. And uh, I I wonder, you know, when you study this kind of thing uh, for a living, you know, you teach this kind of thing for a living, mm-hmm. um, how do you parse that out? Because your field of study is, is mired in genre fiction and pop culture and things like that. How do you, how do you begin to approach that with like students, with other academics? I have, I, I kind of relate to what you're saying. I still have some of that baggage myself, um, especially when mm-hmm. I was doing my PhD in, in Dublin. Um, I did my PhD in Trinity College in Dublin. And um, my peers, a lot of them were studying like James Joyce uh, or, you know, a literature that I suppose we very much consider worth studying, um, high art. Um, so sometimes there was a little bit of, um, I suppose, self-doubt on my part that what I was doing was less worthy or less valuable. Valuable. Um, I have come to terms with this now, and I realize obviously that my work is good in itself, and um, that the work is good. But yeah, I d- I still had that baggage, and I find that students sometimes have it as well. Um, so they might come to a class um, like this if we're talking about a romance novel or about um, a work of crime fiction, expecting expecting it to be very easy. Um, firstly, I do find that they think it'll be. A very easy class, um, which I, I don't like because um, I think you should always be coming with the expectation that you will be challenged. Um, and also sometimes they will question the value of it. If they're used to studying like WB Yeats or, um, you know, Virginia Woolf, um, it can be hard to, I suppose, explain or justify why someone like Nora Roberts or um, Dan Brown is worth talking about in the same classroom. Um, so there is baggage there to unpack, but what I try to do is um, sort of culturally contextualize it and spend time really looking at um, why it's important. Because while I think there is obviously value in studying Virginia Woolf or James Joyce, um, they're not necessarily authors that um, everybody is reading at present. And I think that 
whatever is popular currently, because something is popular, um, that in itself is a starting point for discussion, I think. Um, like, what is it telling us about our cultural moment? What What is it about this that's appealing to us right now? Um, that's where I start from. Um, and usually from there we go and we find, okay, um, if we're reading like Agatha Christie or something, we can find um, kind of interwar context, um, conversations about changing gender roles, things like that. Um, and they do usually come around um, to the idea that there is value in these texts. Um, Watchmen is a great one. Um, we always do Watchmen. And um, they love talking about that because, especially um, in the context of, like we do have American students who um, who study in Ireland and um, they really like the idea of a kind of diverging history, um, a, a different history uh, to the, the, the history of America. Um, and just conversations about power and control and things like that. Um, so I do find that usually when people properly study and like really get into this um the chip on their shoulder kind of goes away um for some people though that that is always an issue and it always will be and i think we just have to coexist with that fact that some people will never value um popular culture as a field of study unfortunately um but it's okay there's enough of us that do so. you know um it, it's interesting that you bring up uh it, it, contextualizing things like Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, mm. uh, you know, Hemingway, et cetera, et cetera, you know, sort of the the great names in American literature um, or the great names in literature. And, you know, the, the, there's a lot of conversation, especially in recent years, where uh, authors, people who want to be authors, you know, uh, writers and stuff say, you know, if you want to write a book in a specific mm -hmm. genre. Um, it's great that you have your literary idols, but you need to be reading books that were published in the last three years, five years. Mm -hmm. How many books have you read that were published in the last year? If you want to be part of this genre, if you want to know what people are uh, you know, consuming right now, you can't be reading something that was popular 60, 70 years ago. You need to know what the current landscape is. And you need to know that because there are conversations that we've had, there is growth that we've done, mm -hmm. there are new ways of thinking about people and culture and, you know, all, all sorts of uh, intersections of identity and stuff that we have, have done that has now informed what the literature landscape looks like today. So it's great that you have your idol, mm -hmm. but you also need to be prepared to meet readers where they are right now. Yes, I I just, Go ahead. I, no, I'm just, I'm always stunned by people who only read the classics or who won't read anything published after um, the 1940s or 50s. And I have met people like that. And I just don't understand, like, how are you going to, especially if you are aiming to write, how are you going to write about a world that is post 9-11, like post pandemic and how all of this stuff that has happened in the past, even in the past, like 10 years, so much has changed for us as a world. Um, I think you're so right. You re you have to be reading, you have to be in tune with the cultural conversation. And it's really hard to do that if you're not reading stuff that's coming out right now. Um, but there can be, I saw, I think I saw a tweet last week, uh, somebody who was a writer or was giving advice to writers and said, you don't have to be a reader to be a writer. And it caused an awful lot of, of conversation because first of all, why would you want to work in this industry if you're not um, a fan of the product that doesn't really make sense to me um I don't think I've ever met a writer who who wasn't a reader it's it's a very strange idea um but yeah no I agree I think it's fine I think it's fine to um aspire to be writing like somebody like Virginia Woolf but if you're not reading um what especially what women are writing um in 2022 then you're out of step, I think, with that conversation. And um, I would question your ability to um, just to engage with what we're thinking at the minute, because surely that's what writing should be. It should be um, helping us to reflect. Do you think that it's it's it should be, the conversation should be less about what X, Y, or Z person wrote at this time? Mm -hmm. And more about why was that important at that time? Because mm -hmm. then you can have a conversation of why is this particular, this new form of, of media important now? Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, th- this person wrote this then, and it was important because it said this. It pushed society this way. It it created this conversation. And this is now important now, you know, this new voice or this new form of, of writing or this new form of entertainment or whatever it is, is important now, you know, instead of focusing on what they did, what what happened afterwards, I think is the better conversation. So looking at a novel or a text as kind of a cultural artifact and how it, um, I suppose, how it changed um, things. Yeah, if you, I've done this and it's really fun. Well, it's fun for me. I'm not sure if it's fun for other people. If you go back and look at like the Victorian bestseller lists, um, it's really funny because you expect to see um, like Dickens and um, really famous names, but so, like so many of them are completely forgotten by history. And um, even 50 years ago, if you look at like bestseller lists um, from then, so many of them are forgotten. And I think that points to what you're saying, which is um, the people we remember um, are not necessarily the people who were best selling in their in their time. Um, so it's always interesting to look back at what was popular. Um, there is a Victorian author called uh, Marie Corelli. I think she was the best selling author of the Victorian period, but very few people like remember her or even recognize the name now. Um, and her work is it's fine, it's not fantastic, um, but it's just interesting to look at it as a cultural artifact and see. Okay, this is what. Um, people were concerned by at the time this is what people were reading about this is what people were thinking about um so i would say if anyone is interested in that um just go back and look at the bestseller list even 20 years ago if you look at what was popular um i think you would be surprised at how few names you recognize um so it's i think it's always good it's like a time capsule into um certain periods of anxiety especially um (laughs) in the world yeah a time capsule of anxiety i i feel like that should be my author bio (laughs) i I am also capsule of anxiety i am also i think i'm a grenade of anxiety (laughs) Um, but yeah no it's just interesting because i think we assume that um we'll recognize the names that were popular um but it's, it's not necessarily the case authors do get forgotten even having been bestsellers for whatever reason, whatever they were doing just fell out of fashion or just wasn't popular. Well, I mean, you know, we, we, we know of the concept in music of a Mm -hmm. one hit wonder, right. Mm -hmm. But we, for some reason, don't think that that applies to anything else. You know, a Mm -hmm. one hit wonder is a song that comes out, it makes a big splash, it hits number one, or at least, you know, the song of the summer. It's a, it's a group or a singer that comes and it's just, it's everywhere. And a few years later, you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like it Aqua with Barbie Girl. Like, you, okay, yeah, that happened. Um, yeah, they had like a few other hits here in Europe. Um, and they were quite popular. <laughs> yeah. We had bad taste, though. That was, it was you would, you, or TATU. Do you remember Tattoo? Yes, the Russians. Oh, yes. The fake lesbian the Russians. Lesbian Russians. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> um, they went to Eurovision. I think they were in Eurovision a few years later, but they oh, were still gross. doing the fake lesbian thing. Um, despite everybody knowing it was fake, like despite it having been exposed. But all of that to say, I think that we think of One Hit Wonders as only being in music. And I wish mm-hmm. that we would kind of also think of it as being in other art forms. Because like you mm-hmm. said, look, go back and look at the bestseller list. You know, mm-hmm. what splashed and, you know, somehow stumbled its way to number one on a bestseller list or even top 10 on a bestseller list doesn't necessarily indicate that it was driving culture forward or something Mm -hmm. like that. I mean, a tweet or a statement, an interview by a celebrity that's like, oh yeah, I really like uh, the novel. I'm going to make something up. Um, You know, I really love the novel Pickled Crickets by Jonathan Franzen. And Mm -hmm. then suddenly, Pickled Crickets is number one. Mm -hmm. It might have been a garbage book, but everybody's Mm -hmm. reading Pickled Crickets. I'm so fascinated, though, by the intersection of, like, what's happening in the world. Like, look at, um, do you remember when Dan Brown wrote The Da Vinci Code? And there was this this rash of, like, conspiracy novels around it. I still still enjoy The Da Vinci Code. I'm sorry, I do. I don't feel guilty. I I loved The Da Vinci Code, and Mm -hmm. I remember picking it up because I was watching, I think, Kenneth Copeland, one of those, like, TV Mm -hmm you know, faith healer, preacher people. Um, And he was like 
if you read this novel, you will go to hell. And I remember him saying that. And I was like, I picked up the book the next day. I was like, <laughs> I, that, that is the best endorsement of all time. Thank you, sir. Uh, and it was fun. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a fun book. Yeah, did, I... did it, did it do anything? No. Just, May, just, I mean, I guess. It just fascinated. The hype around that novel really fascinates me. And the sort of the ensuing conversation about conspiracies. Like so many people like genuinely believed that that was not fiction. Like worryingly believed that that was not fiction. A, I forgot a lot about of, that. Yeah. Yeah. But just something like that, I think. Or like even the, the trends and what's fashionable um, in fiction. They kind of fascinate me just to see what, what's currently popular. Do you remember when... Um, paranormal romances were like everywhere oh, after twilight absolutely yeah. i yeah. mean uh, well not even after Twi- uh, uh, uh true blood you know mm-hmm. the, the sookie stackhouse mysteries here i, I mean yeah those. it's and it's amazing how books written a long time ago can suddenly find a new mm-hmm. audience and then reset what we're doing uh madeline miller's um song of achilles is a really good example oh, yes. of that it came out it did nothing Mm. it was found on tiktok 10 years later a girl threw it at the wall and suddenly madeline miller is now everything she touches is gold yeah you know then cersei comes out and now galatea is Mm. is you know they're they're publishing her short stories in hardcover and it's just amazing how what impacts culture doesn't necessarily equate to immediate success Mm -hmm. uh you know raving critical acceptance it it immediately like Mm -hmm. it can take a long time to be appreciated and there's all sorts of artists and voices and stuff who are very famously not appreciated in their time Mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes they get to live to see themselves become successful but very often they don't it must be the weirdest thing though for an author to be sort of like quietly successful or just sort of doing okay and then to have something like that happen to have your name kind of explode on tiktok or book talk or whatever they call it um but social media i think is is an interesting look at how um fandom can kind of democratize these things um Mm -hmm. so something that's not necessarily critically valued or not necessarily um something that got a lot of critical attention can just explode with ordinary people on twitter or tiktok and then it just becomes this massive um cultural thing um i'm not sure if, if you're aware of this um kind of cultural critique from the the 20s and the 1920s and 30s at the idea of mass culture and um mass culture and popular culture being bad for us being like kind of having a pacifying effect or something that can like lull us into sure yeah but people people still today do that i mean it's whatever is popular must Mm -hmm. be inherently bad because it is popular yes or like superhero movies i mean (laughs) i am a fan of of marvel movies i will say that um and star wars yeah and x-men um and everything but people have this real um a fear that uh, it's lulling us into sort of um, not really paying attention to larger issues. And I really feel like that is so, that's just so condescending because it, it really suggests that we are passive consumers and that we're not able to critically engage with, with something like that, or that we're not able to just enjoy something for the sake of it. And it doesn't, not everything has to be, um, you know, about a larger cultural project or issue. I think it's, it's okay for something to be escapism. I feel well, and the like, thing is, what I think that what I think people do is they lose the ability to critique something mm-hmm. if it doesn't fall into how they've critiqued things before. If it doesn't align with previously accepted metrics for mm-hmm. importance or success, then it cannot be important and it is not successful. Marvel movies are a really good example because, yes, they have become commercially successful things. But I think they have also done a great service to genre stories of all Mm -hmm. types. Now, I'd like to say up front, you know, for the for the folks out there that that know this kind of thing, they have also made it really hard for like mid budget movies to get made because Mm -hmm. everything these days either has to be a tentpole billion dollar blockbuster or 
uh, shoestring budget. So I get that. I I fully understand there's a nuance here. But mm-hmm. as far as the kinds of stories that audiences will show up to watch, Spider-Man No Way Home would never. I, that would have been weird mm-hmm. and unacceptable 10 years ago. Even five years ago, but what movies like Infinity War and Endgame and No Way Home and even Doctor Strange and WandaVision. That would you never, like 10 years ago. No. WandaVision being this critical darling Mm. and getting Elizabeth Olsen like Mm. A-list names on award seasons shortlists like could you imagine WandaVision being one, accepted, two, understood, and three, supported by audiences 10 years ago, 15 years ago? But this think- would have been the weird genre show on sci fi that did not, it would have been like a, a cult phenomenon, yeah, like, you know, 15 say, years ago. I think the stuff that we see now is stuff that we would have seen on the sci fi channel like 15 years ago. And do you remember Legend of the Seeker? Um- Sis! We own. <laughs> Listen, I loved it. Listen, Craig Horner, and I, that's his name, right? The the main guy from so. Legend of the Seek. Listen, listen, sis. My husband and I, <laughs> we have seen every inch of that show. That is a great. That is, that is good. That is the example, though. I go with when people um, <laughs> talk about things like Game of Thrones and Marvel because they don't remember the struggle. Like they don't remember being a nerd back then. When, like, what we got was really low caliber in terms of quality. It just wasn't there. The budget was not there. Like my boyfriend always says, the first time he watched Game of Thrones because he's a huge fantasy nerd, um, he saw the uh, like the armor and the saddlery that the horses were wearing, and he was like, "Okay, this actually has budget. Like they're yeah. really going for this." And that did not happen before. Like no. we got scraps. It was not good. Um, we but had think- the Xena Hercules Power Hour. Yes. We had. Oh yeah. We had. We had, uh, um, we had the uh, Mystic Knights of Tiernan Oak here in Ireland. I know. <laughs> I did a TikTok about that like a year ago, and I was like, I feel like I am the only human being on the face of the planet that remembers this show. I can sing the theme song. I know how all of them summoned their power. I remember all of it. Like, air above me, water before me. Like, listen, earth beneath me, fire within me, baby, forest before me. Like, yes. Oh, it was... I wanted yeah. that dragon playset so bad. It was so like it wasn't even that popular even in Ireland. Um, but I still remember it so vividly. I think I met one of the guys from it at Dublin Comic Con a few years ago, and he was really surprised that anybody like knew him from that. Um, but yeah, but we got like scraps. Like we do not. I think it's it might be a generational thing as well. Like people who are like Gen Z maybe don't remember what it was like when nerd culture was still kind of. A, a guilty pleasure, I guess, or something you were supposed to be ashamed of. It just shocks me how everything that I grew up loving, mm-hmm. but everybody else thought was weird, is now like a sign of success, a thing that people do to like, you know, polish up the rest. I mean, like mm-hmm. people having podcasts as a main source of income or something like you know, like these, like, I'm like, I remember when I started podcasting, like, you were the weirdo. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, like, oh, you've got a podcast? Like, do you live in a basement somewhere? <laughs> you know, like, collecting comics, reading these stories, you know, mm-hmm. like, but getting into the weeds with this stuff, like what a comic book movie was, when the first Spider-Man movie came out was still a pretty beat by beat hero's journey. But what a comic book movie has become today Mm-hmm. can be weird. It can be so weird. What they did on Loki. I mean, it's just yes. what you're allowed to do right now. Did you so see um, transformed? Did you see Legion? Of course. Yes. I that one blew my mind because I, I really didn't yeah. think they would be allowed to it was very for for superhero TV, I, I it kind of blew my mind that they were allowed to go to some of the places that they went to, just in terms of form even and structure and character. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, you're so right. Just things have changed so much. And there's so much intertextuality in comic book movies now and references. And it's just become such a brilliantly um, 
a kind of imaginative space that it, it wasn't. I think maybe they were afraid to to go to some of these places in like 2002 or whenever the first Spider-Man movie came out. Like you kind of knew what mm-hmm. you were going to get. I remember seeing that movie when I was, I think I was like, I would have been like 12 when that movie came out um, and knowing what I was going to get even then. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, I don't think people can appreciate the difference, like what's happened in the past 10 years in terms of these movies and just the wider field of genre fiction and genre um, on TV. Like we would never have gotten, you know, the wheel of time on TV without game of Thrones. Um, we would never have got game of Thrones without Lord of the Rings, you know, just looking at how it's, it's progressed um, and how much has changed. is is just astonishing. Um, so I want to talk about uh, a little bit people that sort of dabble in the realm of commercially uh, acceptable, commercially successful media, um, while also then turning around and doing stuff that, you know, makes the critics happy, but doesn't really mm-hmm. get them as much visibility or as much uh, widespread acclaim. And I feel like the most famous example of that is somebody that most people don't realize as an example of that, and that is Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare's acclaim, if I'm not mistaken, now you're the doctorate in literature, I am not, but from my (laughs) baby, baby studies in uh, literature, Shakespeare's, um, you know, actual, say, for for lack of a better term, like critical success, critical acceptance, were sonnets, Mm -hmm. poems, um, they were they were these smaller art forms. Shakespeare's plays were like the selling sunset of the day. <laughs> like even the English, even the form of English that they were written in was what like a common like a low mm-hmm. a low form of the English dialect or something like that. You could speak to that far better than me. Um, but what what was sh- what was going on with Shakespeare? But yeah, we I suppose we think these days of of Shakespeare as very high art and of the people who would have uh, seen the plays performed as um, maybe upper class or upper middle class. But yeah, it was a common art form for ordinary people. Um, as he said, his poetry was much more valued at the time and um, his history. So, you know, like his um, his kind of biographical plays about kings and queens, um, whereas his dramas were um, were far less valued, which I, th- I do think points to um, this ongoing problem of, of what we see as valuable. Um, if it's teaching us something, it's OK. If it's not teaching us something, if it's pure entertainment, we're a little bit afraid of that. Um, but that larger point about the commercial viability of art and artists who try to I suppose balance between making stuff that will um, get them critical acceptance and making stuff that will pay their bills um, is visible kind of throughout history the history of authors Um, Edgar Allan Poe was a good example of a writer who has written about this about the need to write trash um, because he had to pay his bills um, and very cynically as well but um, it's stuff that we today we value we artistically value that work um, which makes me think that in like a hundred years time it, it could be the case that we maybe not selling sunset but um, stuff that we see as lower art forms um, that there might be some revision where we go back and say okay no this actually is valuable and just because it was written um, with a commercial concern or because um, money needed to be made, that doesn't mean that it's bad. Um, just, I suppose, what you're talking about there is kind of the implicit classism of the arts, um, which is an unfortunate thing, but um, we like to think of creators as kind of above like the concerns of life and making art purely for its own sake and because it's beautiful and because they want to. But obviously, you know, as a creator, you know that sometimes it's just work and that's okay it doesn't always have to be um a purely artistic endeavor for the sake of beauty it can just be okay i need to put something out and it can still be good you know um we're very uncomfortable with that idea though still we like to think that um art should be pure and it shouldn't be <laughs> contaminated with questions of money or funding um that might be another reason why Marvel and the success of Marvel makes us uncomfortable. Because so obviously, as you pointed out, it is a, a genuine industry issue um, that movies like Marvel and things like that are kind of dominating. That is a problem. Um, but also, we just we really don't like thinking of um, art as a commodity. It makes us very um, uneasy. Still, I think. You know, um, 
when you when you talk sort of about uh the the classism of mm-hmm. art and and the way in which we we think you know i think we have it in our heads that certain people appreciate certain kinds of art forms so therefore uh, even even if they don't <laughs> mm-hmm. you know uh, like we have it in our heads that like a certain kind of person must appreciate a certain kind of art form. Mm-hmm. So we kind of in, inherently uh, in, intrinsically value it as, as something more important. Um, but, you know, to go back to what makes an impact, what gets people talking, what, what creates culture almost. Mm-hmm. I do want to start talking a little bit about some of those genre shows uh things like supernatural things like uh you know like you mentioned legend of the secret you know some of those shows that kind of create fandoms and followings and and stuff like that since you know your study is in genre fiction and Mm -hmm. in that kind of world what do you what have you seen in studying that that art form those groups um how they react to to you know their thing mm-hmm. uh you know what what how how do you perceive that i um i'm really fascinated by like fandom culture and fandom studies um i'm working on a murder she wrote project at the minute and we're hoping um it will be an edited collection um on the the show but we're hoping to interview some of the fans um the biggest fans just because this is what i'm interested in um just the relationship between the art and between the fans um like someone like terry pratchett um really encouraged that relationship um i know r.i.p i love him so much um Oh, Terry Pratchett is a god. He is. He he used to. Uh, teach other people him. talk about Virginia Woolf and no, and, Terry Pratchett. and all of that. For it's me, it's Terry, Terry Pratchett. Pratchett. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, um, he used to teach on the masters that I did, but um, he left before I, I did it, unfortunately. So I never got to meet him. Um, but by all accounts, was just an incredible, wonderful person. Uh, but he's somebody that was very encouraging of that relationship between the um the art and the fans. And I am interested in the idea that it can go both ways, and that fans can like affect. Um, you know, look at let's look at something like Star Wars and the effect that Reddit had on mm. the last Star Wars movie. Um, but there can be a symbiotic relationship there. Whereas other people, um, I think J.K. Rowling is an example. Not to invoke her name too much, um, but they they really have issues with um, with too much fan fiction or with the fans claiming ownership over um, the product. So it can, it can differ, I think, depending on the the creator. Some creators are very welcoming of it. Um, and they really cultivate that fan base and encourage things like fan fiction um, and head cannons and things. Um, I think it depends um, on our our perception of what art is and who it belongs to. Um, mm. I very much believe that something popular belongs to the fans. Um, obviously not legally in terms of copyright. I think <laughs> it's fine for the author to, to own copyright, but um, I really think fans should be encouraged to um, to engage with the, these universes and um, create fan fiction on their own. Like I, I am a fan fiction fan. I think it can be a really um, nice kind of universe expanding thing. Um, but I was having this conversation recently uh, with somebody about um, – the great gatsby i think the copyright on the great gatsby is up this year um she's writing on um queer representations in the novel and apparently the fitzgerald estate has been very protective of the estate and very um against any queering of of the characters or the text um but there's it thrives in fan fiction like there's a huge subculture of fan fiction sure um like web comics and people writing stories um <laughs> who really lean into that and i think stuff like that could be fascinating and really i think challenges the idea that popular culture is passive or that it makes us passive i think it can be popular culture can be whatever we make it it can be a space for queering um it can be a space for rebellion and for um challenging ideas it just depends on what we're doing with it if that makes sense you know now there is a space at which i think the ownership that fans feel over a thing Mm -hmm. goes overboard it can Um, become toxic yes yeah it it can Mm -hmm. become quite toxic uh you know i talked Mm -hmm. to joshua conkle who was uh a writer behind chilling adventures of sabrina and Mm -hmm. uh, a series of unfortunate events the adaptations of both of those um and you know just kind of talking about how uh, fans 
can can go too far mm-hmm. uh, in in their feelings of ownership of certain pieces of media. Um, they'll create these head cannons. They'll create mm-hmm. these ships with certain characters. Yes. And when they don't see them then reflected in the story that the writers were already writing and mm-hmm. filming a year ago, <laughs> you know, yes. or two years ago, or however long this was made, um, or basing it on the source material or whatever it is, mm-hmm. that how just angry they get. And I don't, yeah. I think there still needs to be a space for storytellers to tell their story. Mm-hmm. And if you want to go tell a story, you go tell that story. Exactly. I think that people need to, I think there is a line as a fan where you can say, okay, this is what I want it to be. And this is what I enjoy, but it's okay if the creators of the show are going in a different direction. Um, Like something Game of Thrones, I think is a good example. That last season had a lot of weird fan service. Um, The final Star Wars movie, again, I think was a corrective to The Last Jedi, which I loved. I loved The Last Jedi. I thought it was very brave. Um... But yeah, I think you're right. It can become, especially in an age where we have um, we have so much input from everybody all the time. Like there's there's a constant stream of voices on Reddit and Twitter and TikTok, um, and I'm sure as a creator, it's very hard to ignore that, um, or to think, okay, this is really what people want, so maybe I should do this. Um, and there is very much a sense of entitlement. Like George R. R. Martin obviously famously hasn't finished um, his series and it is a point of contention for fans. I, I am a huge fan and I do want him to finish the series, but um, there are people who will go on his blog and just spam comments and say things like, well, you're going to die soon, so you should be finishing, you should be writing your book. Like, I don't understand why people think that's okay or that they're entitled to say things like that to creators. That makes me very uncomfortable. It makes me very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. as a writer of books and as a person who puts media out in the world because uh, something something I had to learn, uh, other friends of mine who are farther along in their authorial careers when I was about to have my debut, they said, now you're going to need to block Goodreads. Don't Mm -hmm. go look at the reviews on Amazon, you know, because reviews are not there for you. You Mm -hmm. need to tune out what other people say Mm -hmm. not because you should absolve yourself of any criticism or anything like that but you are going to hyper focus on the one person who just really hated the thing you put out in the world and you're going to ignore the hundreds of people the thousands of people that loved what you put out in the world Mm -hmm. and then there's people that just don't even know what a review is supposed to be you know they're like i bought this for my grandson and he hated it okay (laughs) right or you know on amazon you'll see reviews where it's like uh uh you know oh the box came wet one star (laughs) it's like well that's is that really added adding to the way Mm. that reader i mean that's that readers will see oh it's got six one star reviews and if all of Mm. them are about shipping is that really about the book? Is that fair? But yeah. like, it's 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 funny, you know, talking about reviews and the way that audiences relate to things and the way that we focus on such bad reviews. It's so interesting because, you know, not reading mine, but just going and reading reviews mm-hmm. of almost any book, you know, when you go read the ne- the middling to negative reviews, they just seem to get less and less about the book itself yes. and more about what the reader wanted the book to be instead. Yes. Um, I think though you could have put your finger on something which is a problem with what like we've talked there about people be, being uncomfortable with the idea of art as commodity, and I think when we do perceive, um, uh, oh kitty, um, when we do perceive um art as a commodity, I think people get this entitlement or sense that like you work for them as a creator that they're paying you money to work for them so you should be doing what you're told um that's ve- that's become very common um mm-hmm. in fan cultures like i want this so it should be happening now um so yeah i think you're right and i have seen amazon reviews in particular that are just incoherent rants about like larger problems that the person has or um problems with the genre they're not really specific to the the actual book um it just makes me wonder though if (laughs) things like amazon and goodreads um have become incredibly toxic for authors because um so much of it of your um their success is reliant on these reviews and 
fans, those kinds of toxic fans can have a lot of power and control that they really shouldn't have um, in this kind of landscape. Um, so I'm, not, I'm actually not a fan of Goodreads. Um, I own a Kindle and I, I do read, I read I download books from Amazon, but um, I do try to avoid it as much as I can because I don't like that um, the marketplace where it's like, well, this book has six negative reviews, so I probably shouldn't buy it or um you know, as you say, when you read that, when you actually read the reviews, they're not informed or intelligent at all. Um, they're just ranting or just nonsense. Like that makes it, it makes me uncomfortable that the success of creators is kind of dependent on that kind of um, metric these days. I, I really don't like that. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I can't imagine. It, 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 it's so hard because uh, mm. so many people are thinking that they are participating in a system that is helpful. I, I, mm-hmm. I don't know. I still, I still think that people think they're being helpful, but what we, you know, something that a, a friend of mine who worked in radio for many years told me years before I ever thought that I could ever write any book, let alone multiple books mm-hmm. was um, what she learned from being a radio DJ is that people typically only call in if they're mad about something. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they very rarely call in. She was like, you know, it's, it's funny because even when we host contests like radio contests or something like that, far less people participate in those than you think they would, uh, there, there would be, you know, far less people call in to, to do anything, you know, to share Mm -hmm. a story or to whatever. But if you want to let somebody complain, (laughs) People will complain oh my gosh. all day. Okay. But it's harder to get people to to come and say why they liked something. I need to tell you about this Irish DJ. I'm not sure if you've heard of this man. His name is Joe Duffy. Okay. He's a very successful older radio broadcaster here in Ireland. And his daily show is literally just complaints. Like he picks a topic, so it might be like sex on TV or you know, the paramedic uh, paramedics in Ireland aren't responding as quickly as they should. Something like that. And then he'll just get people to call in. And it's so popular, especially with older people. They, they will just call in and just rant. And they mm-hmm. absolutely love it. It's just, I can't listen to it because it's, it's absolutely awful. But um, it's just this really weird, conservative, um, whingy thing where people just really like to be angry publicly and share their anger with other people and talk about how angry they are and how disappointed they are and I think your friend is completely right this is a perfect example of that of um just like airing your grievances people just really love doing that I'm not sure why to be honest um my rule for reviews, I I only put reviews on book reviews on Twitter, uh, but my rule is that I won't leave a bad review. So if I didn't like something, I just won't review it or I just won't talk about it. Um, whereas if I liked it, I will talk about it because I think, you know, that's just my opinion. So One know. of the things that I, I think is just so weird about sort of online comment section, review section culture i guess if there is a culture is going and looking at people that leave these you know like these kinds of reviews that we're talking about these these reviews that almost have nothing to do with the book itself or uh whatever and you go because you can actually see i'm just so curious sometimes i'll you know Mm -hmm. i don't know i'm looking up a cookbook for anthony porofsky or something and you go and you look at the the reviews to see you know or whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And you go and you look, well, you can actually see like you, you know, if you're commenting on Goodreads, you've got a profile. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll just click and I'll see, oh, this person's reviewed 700 books and their average rating is like a 2.9 or a 3.0. And I'm like, oh, so you just hate books. (laughs) Yes, I do that as well. I, cause I want to know. You just hate reading. Just say that. Yeah. It's so weird, like, because there are people on Amazon I've seen who just make a career out of like bad reviews. Like, I remember when bad reviews, not giving bad reviews. Like, I remember when Twilight was popular. Um, I I liked the first Twilight book. I must admit, when it came out, um, I was young. A lot of people did. It sold a lot of copies. Yeah, I I am happy that we're having some kind of revision on Twilight. I still don't think the series is good, but I do think that the fans got an awful lot of undeserved shit for being kind of. (laughs) young women who liked a, a romance novel um but i remember oh my god when, young women who like things people hate young women who how like dare things. they one direction how dare young women like neither, things? 
no, sure. they're not allowed. Um, but I remember when that, like, the hate for Twilight became a huge internet phenomenon. There were, like, entire websites dedicated to bad reviews. And, like, if you went on Amazon, there would just be people, like, repeatedly just giving bad reviews to the books. And it was so strange because they really, they weren't enjoying it. And they also weren't, like, enjoying it and hating it at the same time. They were just enjoying hating it. It was really exactly just something I've never seen before. Like, they were really taking pleasure in, like, venting at this thing that was, like, obviously not good, but you know you could just ignore it you don't have to be on a website talking about how much you hate it that's that's kind of weird in retrospect you know going back to a point that uh you know we kind of circled around earlier just sort of the value that we place on different types of media Mm -hmm. um i have always and i i you know i have just personally felt like the best dramatic actors are comedians are, mm-hmm. are comic actors, people who are famously comic actors. I think Robin Williams is a fantastic example of that. Yes. Uh, uh, Melissa McCarthy just recently had, uh, you know, a mm-hmm. few years ago, um, had a wonderful turn uh, that landed her an Oscar nomination. Uh, I forget the title of the movie. Um, but, oh, uh, yes, you know, I know. I, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, no, can, can, can you ever forgive me or something like that? And yes, that. I think that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, when you talk to actors, when you, you know, listen to interviews, watch interviews, that kind of thing, dramatic actors will tell you, oh, it's so much harder to be a comic actor. That mm-hmm. timing, that ability to make somebody laugh, it's easier to mm-hmm. make somebody cry. It's easy to sit there and go into these dark places because that's kind of what we ex- we value that in in acting. But like... Mm-hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio could not make me laugh if he tried. I don't. I feel the same way. Um, what? It's, it's just so much harder to make people like I. I would take Will Ferrell any day over Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, or, now you know what I mean. That's see now. I know. I know you're I, not. A, I know you're not a huge. Fan. <laughs> I am sorry. I'm sorry to all of the Will. Where Will Fannell's out there, um, he's not my jam. Now that being said, space. that being said, mm-hmm. uh, 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 the the movie with him and Maggie Gyllenhaal, um, the the you know the writer. Oh, what was it called? Yes, uh, that I know. yeah, that is that is easily his best movie mm-hmm. ever. And it's a it's a truly great film, but it is because mm-hmm. he's not doing that thing. Like Jim Carrey did the same thing. Like yes, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he did but Eternal I... Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and proved my theory correct. <laughs> no, I think you're right, though. I do think that being successful comedically um, is always harder. Um, it's the same with horror. Like I find horror movies. Um, are culturally undervalued because we I, for some reason we just don't we don't really value talk um, to me about horror when we talk know, about underappreciated genre fiction or underappreciated mm-hmm. genre films horror is always at the top of the list mm-hmm. i as you probably know am not a huge horror fan mm-hmm. i do not like to be scared i don't want to be mm-hmm. scared and I am much more willing to sit there and escape into a very silly comedy with a very stupid premise mm-hmm. than I am a very stupid horror movie with a very stupid premise. Um, it's not escapist for me. What am I missing in horror fiction? What 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 am I getting wrong? How can I appreciate horror more? Okay, so for me, it's less about being scared. Like it's not that it's not necessarily that I want to be scared. Sometimes if it's something really jumpy or fun that's okay like in a roller coaster way you know it's it's scary but you know you're not really in danger um but with really good horror I think what I get from it is just I think just some reflection on like fear in general or the idea of fear or anxiety um maybe that's it for me like I wasn't for a long time I wasn't a horror fan I was a real wuss um it was only in my kind of early 20s that I started getting into horror as a genre and I just find that it raised a lot of questions about power and fear and anxiety um something like hereditary for example which I know you did not like um 
I loved just because it's a bad movie. It's, it is a bad it's movie. Not, it it is not no a sense. bad movie. It no it makes, there is no it narrative makes structure so to that movie. Sense. The ending it's makes fantastic. absolutely no sense with the rest of the movie. It is bad. Tony Collette deserves better. Uh, Tony Collette and Knives Out was the one who should have gotten the nomination, not the Tony Collette. It, 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 no, abs- no, no. Okay. Midsummer taught me that Ari Aster can can write, but mm-hmm. but but no, but Hereditary no. No, I can't. No. I cannot. I just can't disagree more. I love. I love Hereditary. I could talk all day about it. I won't. But um, but I something like hereditary. that. Something like that is an example because it didn't. It didn't scare me. I wasn't scared, but it just um. There's nothing to be scared about. It's, it's, it's just weird. But I felt. But there was just this. There was just a sense of like dread throughout, which I found fascinating. And for a genre, okay, but for a diff, a different horror movie, we'll say, um, uh, for something like that to inspire that feeling in me is something I don't really get from a lot of other genres. So that could be it for me. Um, I do. I teach gothic fiction sometimes and horror, and um, sometimes people are very averse to it. Like they're. If, I think it's horror is the kind of genre where if you're not a fan, you're really not a fan. People don't really dabble in horror as much um it, it's just something that you either really like or you really don't like um but i just find I can, it can be a really I good can space work for myself up to it like if if there's a mm. horror movie that everybody's watching i can work myself up to watch it like i worked myself mm-hmm. into watching hereditary and i think that's why mm. i get so upset when i hate it because i'm just like listen i mentally prepared mm. i spiritually prepared i i i cleaned my you know i got ready and that it was like the ring by the time I finally mm. watched The Ring, I was like, this is bad. <laughs> this is not entertaining. I was like, I-, I guess it's, I guess it was entertaining. Um, or the Blair Witch Project back in the day. Like, I was yeah. like, well, I guess it's entertaining, but it's not scary. <laughs> I am Weird. not a fan of the Blair Witch uh, movies. I, I actually don't really like the um, American found footage movies, like Paranormal Activity. They don't scare me, so they don't scare me, and I don't get anything from them. So, from a horror movie, I either want to be scared in a fun way, or I want to have some larger engagement with, like, you know, a cultural anxiety or something like that. So, I have to get something like that. It can't just be people wandering around a forest for two hours. I, I get nothing from that. That's just annoyed me um but i am i am a huge horror fan now it, it it took it took time like it was a process of becoming a horror fan um so you might it might still happen for you if you if you desire it if you pursue it um but tell you what, like the will, witch, if you will send me a watch list i, I will, will watch i will list. Okay, I will put together a watch list of go- of really good horror. Although since we disagree maybe, maybe on hereditary, we could do like, a, like a Patreon exclusive, maybe we'll put together a watch mm. list, and like maybe mm. we can have you back on, and we'll just do a Patreon exclusive of like we'll just redo the watch list and have a discussion yes. about those movies. How's that? That would be really good. Like, have you seen um, okay. have you seen the witch Robert Eggers film, The Witch? I own The Witch. It's a great movie. Yes, and see, that's a good horror movie, and you appreciate it as a good horror movie. It's a great movie. I I almost don't even know that it's a horror. Mo- that strikes me more as like a gothic movie because of just sort of the imminent sense of dread in the entire thing. I don't even is that horror? It is. I mean, de- I mean, I can't separate out gothic from horror. They're they are linked. Um, but no, I think it absolutely is horror. Um, like you're you're feeling horror when you're watching it, and that's sure. that's that's horror. Sure. Um, sure. But something like that it would be an example, I think, of a horror movie that didn't necessarily scare me. Like I wasn't terrified right. watching it, but yeah, I no. was. There's, I no, was in there's dread. no scary. There's no jumps. There's mm-hmm. no slasher except for the baby. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like there is this, like you feel the dread. There's something really wrong. I think that wrongness is what I enjoy about horror. That there's something. I'm not sure something that can't almost be expressed, but you feel it. You don't get that from other, I don't get that from a lot of other, other genres. Speaking of uh, wrongness that we both enjoy, oh. can we talk about the value of reality television? Oh gosh. Yes. Um, because we, I mean, that's I think how we found each other on social media is yes. just like talking about yes. drag race and Mm -hmm. selling sunset and just all of the, just the trashiest reality television. Mm. What, what, I mean, is that, 
is that genre? Is that is that you mm-hmm. know is too hot to handle telling us something? I will still defend the first season of The Circle as a great sociological experiment. Uh-huh. I love the seasons circle. have gotten progressively stupider, but the uh-huh. original season of the circle was just such a cool, sometimes heartbreaking mm-hmm. sociological experiment that I love. I I agree. I think the circle is really good TV. Like as you said, it has gotten stupider with like twists yes. and like yeah. people playing stupid games, but um, yeah. still a really good concept for for a TV show, as I think Big yes. Brother originally was. Um, but I mean, I think reality TV is the final frontier for genre studies um, for like making, I suppose having a conversation about whether something is valuable or not. Like, I mean, is too hot to handle telling us something about <laughs> ourselves or about society? I'm not sure. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not finished the third. I've, I still have one episode left of the, the third series. So there might be a huge cultural revelation. Oh, I, in I, haven't, I haven't watched this latest season. Uh, it's is, not, it's is not, it worth it? it? No, there's no, it's not good. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, it's like they made a photocopy of the first season that's just fading. Um, it's just, uh, no, it's not. I would yeah, miss so, it. Some, of, some of these shows, once they've been at, well, like if they have a weird trick, you know, the circle, mm-hmm. uh, the, the original too hot to handle, you know, when they have the first one that I remember seeing like this that they could never do again, so they didn't was the mole. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the mole? Yes, I never with- watched it, I've heard of it. Oh my god! Okay, so the mole—I think it's available on Netflix um, mm-hmm. now, or or Hulu, or one of the streamers. Um, go watch it. Anderson Cooper hosts it, and the entire concept is—it it was sort of a combination of Survivor and the Amazing Race, almost mm-hmm. like they had a group of people, and they're all working. You know, they're all set. You know, they're given tasks to do. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a cash prize at the end and the more successful you are, the more money you get and blah, 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 blah. Um, but the, the trick to the mole was there was a mole. There was one person mm-hmm. amongst the group who was there sent there by the producers to undermine Ooh. the tasks, to undermine the work of everybody mm-hmm. else. And you were trying every week to vote off the mole Mm -hmm. to try to figure out who was the person undermining it. So you're putting this, you know, psychological sense of unease and distrust immediately. You don't immediately reveal that there's a mole. You tell Mm -hmm. somebody later on. Um, But then it, it sets the, you know, it's that Lord of the flies, you know, the paranoia sets in kind of thing. And it created this whole extra level of storytelling. But the problem with the mole wasn't that it wasn't a good show it was that once you did it Mm -hmm. you couldn't do it again you can't do it again and come up with the same thing at least not without trying to throw a ton of new twists in that take away Mm -hmm. from what the show did so it didn't do it they they did one season and that was Mm -hmm. it and it was great and i feel like even shows like the circle too hot to handle that we think of as silly Mm -hmm. their original seasons i think tell us something about ourselves Mm mm-hmm Sometimes, like even like old seasons of like The Bachelor, like they, you know, The Bachelor asks, what is attraction? What is love? Can, you know, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. The the circle tells us, you know, who who are we really behind our profile mm-hmm. picture? You know, uh, discussions of, of personal value and worth and, uh, you know, the the economy of of body politics and the way that you value your own body and presentation mm-hmm. in the world you know the 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 catfishes like oh my gosh they were the most amazing part of yes. the original season That's, of the circle yeah that question of identity and whether it matters to you if a person that you think you know is not who you thought they were um mm-hmm. i agree and too hard to handle even the idea that we can i suppose build relationships without um it's a bit stupider but build relationships without physical contact or without um building too, a sexual too relationship hot. Mm. too hot to handle i think wants to be taken seriously yes um and it just come on like it's, come on like what i I think it has the same problem though as what you talked about, where it just 
the first season kind of worked because they had no idea what was going to happen but exactly subsequently it's very apparent that they they know what show they're on and they're acting like they don't know is really fake and they're like oh yeah we set up a fake reality show and they think they're on this reality show but obviously they don't think that they know they're on too hard to handle they're not that stupid yeah. so it's just yeah. I, I can't buy into that premise so I, yeah I can't enjoy it um, yeah. but I think you're right I think that reality TV can be it can tell us things about ourselves um, and it can also just be very entertaining which is that's a value in itself um, but it depends like something like Selling Sunset is I suppose more narrativized version of reality TV um, yeah. and it, it's more akin to like a soap opera at times than to like reality um like the most recent season i think was just everybody fighting with christine yeah and i i wonder because you know i watch the show i enjoy the Mm -hmm. show but i wonder i even sometimes have to sit back and say what is it about this that i'm enjoying because Mm -hmm. I get that for a lot of those kinds of shows, a Keeping Up with the Kardashians, a Selling Sunset, uh, even you know the Osborne sort of started this mm. sort of genre of of reality TV, just sort of being the story of us, a heightened mm. version of this group of people, you know, uh, uh, mm. Real Housewives, that kind of thing, where it over the years we've learned that it's contrived. You know, there, there, mm. there are writers. If you look in the credits, there's writers. <laughs> why, why does a reality show need writers? Mm. You know, they, they help kind of create scenes or, or if something happened off camera, they'll help to like recreate it so that it mm. can be captured on camera. That kind of thing. Like we know that that's happening. But I also wonder what it's doing to us because these are still real people. Mm-hmm. And as, as, as much as it's contrived, it's also not. There's this weird balancing act. And, you know, I feel that way as somebody that puts himself out there in that content creator world as where as well, where it's mm-hmm. like there's a version of myself that is the person that you all are consuming this content from. And I'm like, but that's not me. Mm-hmm. So there's I wonder what the- it's doing to us because he, the audience for these shows, it's like, Oh, you know, I love Christine because she's just gonna, you know, oh, the the show is Christine, and I'm like, what does it say mm-hmm. about us that the show is Christine? Because Christine is just saying terrible things to, I mean, just awful, awful, she's, awful things. She's basically a mon a monster at this stage. A like, monster. She's, she's just a terrible person, and I, like is not even trying to hide or pretend that she's not a, like she's openly a terrible person. Um, but I think, yeah, that's an interesting question, I suppose, about the conjunction of social media and reality TV as well, because we all have, we're all living in a world now where we have these like avatars of ourselves, these social media mm. versions of ourselves where you're not posting your, you know, your worst day or your really shit news. It's always good news and it's always, um, you know, the best version of yourself that you're putting forward. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if reality TV has almost like trained us to do that because, you know, on social media, there's always a do over. You can always delete, you can always redo, you can always filter. Um, and something like the Kardashians, I think the early, the early seasons of the Kardashians are a good example of that, of like narrativizing yourself and making yourself into mm-hmm. a better, like fi- they've physically made themselves into better versions. Like they're not the same people that they no. were ten- like they're physically not this like chloe kardashian is a different person to the person she was six months ago it's just hard it's really hard to keep up and it's interesting that you bring up chloe because wow why people related to chloe mm-hmm. 10 years ago mm-hmm. is it, it, it is gone mm-hmm. it's gone you know chloe was just the 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 person who wasn't the supermodel in this she family like of supermodels. She looked like a real person. Yeah. She looked like a real person. She yeah. had a real person's face. Mm. And, you know, she had a real person's body. And mm. and as as uh as much as as Kim's body sort of changed how everybody valued the butt and stuff, you know, mm. the curves, it's just like people still very much valued Chloe for these pretty big substantial real reasons like we're Mm -hmm. talking about you know the realness of reality tv people valued her for a very real legitimate reason they saw themselves reflected at least in part in her Mm -hmm. and she systematically destroyed that person 
Yes, like really physically deconstructed and built herself back up into the ideal Kardashian, which is terrifying. It's like the monster mm-hmm. is eating itself. Like they, because she has talked about on social media, she has talked about feeling very insecure about her body, and to me, it, there, it she doesn't seem to she doesn't seem to be aware of the link between their creation of that standard and her reaction to it. You know. Um, exactly that's really fascinating they, they created this impossible body standard that yeah. then fans absorbed turned mm-hmm. into an entire an entire brand an economy mm-hmm. a way of living a, a lifestyle and then she then became the consumer of that yeah. product that yeah. they created it's so weird it's so weird because she posted this whole rant on instagram about how, fe- how she felt insecure about her body and just really did not seem to see any connection between like the years of kardashian um conditioning that we've undergone and how she feels or how um she doesn't want to see that self reflected back which is really sad um really really sad actually and just the idea that we had this relatable um person or at least somebody relatable in that world that's gone now and um has become victim to that standard um is really intriguing but yeah i do think um the kardashians as an early example are fascinating an example of that um best self and like filtering everything and making sure that even your real moments are kind of scripted and like everything we see even the fights that we see on the kardashians um tv show are kind of heavily directed and filtered and we're not you know we're not really seeing Mm -hmm. what goes on behind closed doors i'm not i'm I'm actually not really a fan of the kardashians just because um (laughs) yeah like (laughs) I'm, I feel like everything I know about them has been against my yeah, will. Yeah, same. I like I've never sought out the Kardashians, but just I I don't I don't really like what they represent or stand for, and I don't like what they've done. Um, but they do they still fascinate me because if you do what if you watch their clips, they're like they're almost like androids. Like they're just these really beautiful women, but they're just saying they're talking, but there's no meaning in what they're saying, and they they kind of inhabit these massive white houses that are like museums, and they don't eat or when they do eat it's salad and nothing else and it's just it's very there's something very surreal about them as characters or like as types to me they're they're almost like a simulacrum of humanity like they're not really real um there's some weird unattainable thing that we like observing like animals in a zoo or i, I don't know they they're they're very strange they they make me very um i don't say i don't want to say uncomfortable but i'm i'm just fascinated by them in the same way that i would be fascinated by like a rare animal they're just they're very strange you know uh a show that i know that we both love that I feel like is the opposite of that. It is it is a subculture. It is a it is a community using a tool to drive conversation, to create change in a, in an often silly way, but it's helping to humanize people. Is is shows like Drag Race, mm-hmm. um, which uh, you know you combine Drag Race and Pose, and we got that HBO Max show um, about ballroom culture, which yes. is phenomenal. But I think it's so interesting how shows like that have normalized culture that was reviled, oh, just absolutely. utterly reviled, because mm-hmm. it it shows at least enough of the human side mm-hmm. of this culture that people are, I don't want to say desensitized to it, but just it, it's, it's, you know, it's that in-group, out-group dynamic. You know, the mm-hmm. out-group is no longer quite so out there anymore. Yeah, I, I know people... Um people will often shit on drag race for kind of mainstreaming drag or for uh, what they think of as kind of undervaluing or devaluing it. But the work that drag race has done in terms of representation in the past 10 years, like I 10 years ago, when I was watching drag race, I had like straight roommates who would not watch with me who Mm -hmm. were just perplexed or disgusted by the idea of it. These days it's so mainstream. It's so normalized. It's so accepted in a way that, I, I don't think they actually get enough credit. I know people complain about like Emmys and Drag Race getting Emmys and stuff and um, becoming um, far more mainstream than it has been. But that's so huge just for, as you say, for what it's done for other kind of reality shows that focus on similar things, um, just for like humanizing people that previously just did not have 
um, just didn't have the privilege of being humanized on reality TV. Um, like, look at what was happening, you know, even 15 years ago on things like, um, you know, America's Sex Top Model or um, American talk shows, like people who were trans or non-binary um, or in any way diverge from heteronormativity were not humanized on reality TV. They were just were not people. They were not seen as people. Um, and Drag Race has done so much work for, for that, for... Um, like you said, for just showing us the real stories of people who don't really inhabit that gender gender binary or who don't fit with that heteronormative ideal. And um, it makes me laugh how the first season of Drag Race and the early seasons kind of took, obviously took a lot of inspiration from Top Model, but like really built on that and built something incredibly um, important and significant. And it's become so self-referential. Um, I, I'm such a huge, a huge fan of Drag Race. I'm such a huge advocate for Drag Race, but I, I really think we don't, um, we almost don't even have perspective on how much has changed because of Drag Race, because of RuPaul, who obviously has done a lot of, um, kind of problematic things, um, apart from Drag Race that, um, that people are, it, it's okay if people want to, want to call RuPaul out for that, but just the work that Drag Race has done, um, like here in Ireland, the idea that, a TV show like that would be on on TV here is astonishing. I mean, um, I mean, even I think in the mid nineties, up until like the early mid nineties, it wasn't even legal to be gay in Ireland um, or eighties. Um, so, like, we, I think we do have to pause to appreciate how astonishing that moment is. How far we've come. Like, there's there's going to be a drag race Brazil. Um, like for for somewhere like Brazil, that's massive. Just to think that um, people like that will be represented on TV has, has just doesn't happen in certain places. So you're absolutely right, and I think make a really good point about what these kind of cultural reflections can do for us. What it can do for us to see people like that on TV, even if it is scripted, even if it's not entirely real, um, it's still important. And yeah, for me, Drag Race is like the anti Kardashians. It's it's reality TV that has helped us progress culturally in a way yeah, that maybe just, the Kardashians have just not. Be- just because it's not even a mainstream comedy or a mainstream drama, mm-hmm. I feel like genre fiction genre stories even reality shows as its own kind of genre subculture or whatever Mm. that's where queer people underrepresented minority and Mm -hmm. that's where they've seen themselves that's where those boundaries Mm -hmm. have been broken um and i think that's that's why it continues to be important dr eva burke I could talk to you for a million years and I can't wait to do it because we absolutely have to do a follow-up about uh horror movies but um yes uh, but if people want to um, contact you, if people want to follow you and uh, follow your thoughts on grand high <laughs> literature or whatever Christine is doing on Selling Sunset, where can they do that? Mm-hmm. They can do that on Twitter. My Twitter is um, EVA underscore B89. Um, I am also on academia.edu. If you Google my name, um, I should come up. And I, um, I'm actually also on TikTok, but... Um, for me, that's mostly just a scrolling platform. Um, but there, I do put up cat videos, so um, you can find a link to my TikTok on my Twitter if you're interested in seeing um, videos of my cat. Um, thank you so much. This was so fun, and I I really do want to do a follow up on horror because I think we can. I will. I will do it. I will not be a baby. I will not be a wimp. I mm-hmm. will watch. Give me like the top five, like a baby. Okay. Uh, I, mm. I, a baby person who doesn't love horror, who hated Hereditary. Don't put that on the list. Okay. Okay. No, my my best but friend hated I Hereditary as well. I liked Midsummer, mm. so like I can be saved. I feel like. Right. Um. So you know, put together I, that I list. So. We'll make it a Patreon exclusive, and we'll do a follow up there. Mm. We will. That Thank will be you amazing. so much. Thank you so much. This was so fun.